Okay, everyone, I, I think we're ready to get started. Um, my name is Andrew Bomberger. I'm the Transportation Planning Coordinator here at, at Tri-County Regional Planning Commission. Um, joining me here is, is, is Kyle Snyder, another Transportation Planner, and Justin from a, from a late running meeting, and I'm letting him catch his breath right now, is Steve Deck, our, our Tri-County Executive Director. Um, we're, we're holding this this public information session kind of in lieu of our or of our uh, normal in person public meeting um, strategies that we typically do as part of the uh, public comment period for a regional transportation plan. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share our screen. We actually have like a what, what we call a story map. Um, kind of walks you through the basics and you will be able to, to have access to this after after this meeting. So let, I'm gonna share screen. Um, Steve. My turn? Sure, <laughs> Steve. All right, uh, this is uh, Steve Deck and I, we're just gonna Kind of walk you through the highlights of the update to the regional transportation plan but before i do that just a couple of kind of introductory uh comments as as andrew indicated uh my name is steve deck i'm the executive director here at tri-county we are the staff if you're not familiar with tri-county regional planning for what's known as hats or the harrisburg area transportation study which is basically a, a federally designated group to oversee uh, the prioritization and programming of federal transportation funds across the, the Harris metropolitan area, which in this case is defined as Cumberland, Dauphin, and Perry counties. So we're basically charged with working with and other stakeholders across the transportation related needs and priorities to then apply uh, to the selection of projects for what we call the TIP uh, or Transportation Improvement Program, which is basically the funding mechanism to turn to actual uh, system improvement. So that's what you're part of today is the planning exercise that we're responsible for doing in order to identify those priorities and turn them into uh, legitimate transportation improvements. So that's what we're gonna give you uh, the highlights for. Um, we last did this only, only a couple of years ago, um, but one of our efforts here uh, at Tri-County and HATS is to keep this planning exercise a live activity. So, while we're adopting a plan or expect to adopt the plan here in September, this is an ongoing effort. Andrew will tell you a little bit about that a uh, little later, um, but we, we thank you for being part of this process as part of the plan adoption phase, but also encourage you to continue to participate in transportation planning over the long term, because it's, it's literally an ongoing process that never really ends. So, um, what Andrew's doing uh, here is he's going to run you through what, as he said, the story map that we created that kind of walks you through the process. So the first part of the uh, RTP, as we refer to it, are the goals and objectives. Slight updates here, um, revisions. I, I would actually say the maybe the biggest revision that we've done recently to the goals and objectives relates to safety and we did that in the context of the last plan and have maintained that where it's it's really i think our primary and overriding goal uh to get as close to eliminating uh crashes across our region as we can but as you can see um as he scrolls down through here um there's there's a you know, pretty comprehensive set of goals and objectives related to the plan. So you can see improve performance and operation, expand choices, uh, improve quality of life. Um, so 
you can you can see I don't need to read them all for you, but you see what the overriding goals, the plan are. And then here's a little section real quick on uh, what's new. And we're actually going to run through these highlights um, with you here today. So you can see uh, we've been doing a lot of work. As I mentioned, that overriding goal is safety. We've been doing a lot of work um, to improve our capabilities in terms of safety improvements. Um, also, a lot of focus on bike ped uh, or non-motorized transportation and making sure that we align that list of needs and priorities with the goals and objectives in the plan itself. And I just want to add that uh, as we go through these sections, um, the, the plan itself is, is all web-based. And we actually have a, a web page that, that's, that's set up. It was included in all, if you receive the email um, with, with this meeting announcement, you've gotten the link to this page. This, this page kind of runs through the entire plan. All of these links take you to the to the updated um, the updated version. So if you click on one, then there's navigation uh, to the next, or you can go back, you know, back to the back to this landing page. There's also lots of you know, there's links for a printable copy. Uh, here's registration links for each of our two public meetings today's and then in August. Uh, if you want to make a comment, um, that link is here as well. Lauren, she's actually on the call here, but she's the one kind of collecting the, the official public comments that actually need to be made in writing so that we have a document uh, of them. Then here's all of the sections. Uh, and then some of our other kind of supplementary material and the, the, the kind of other required documents that, that we produce as part of this plan. So just want to, before we kind of dive into the, into some more of the, of the meat of the plan, just to make sure everybody kind of knows how to, how to get to these sections um, and how it all kind of fits together. So. Yeah, I'll just add to that just a little bit more in terms of our, our schedule uh, in, in moving towards adoption. Um, this is the first kind of public outreach uh, effort, direct public outreach effort as part of this process. A formally public comment period started on July 1st. It will run through the end of August. And then HATS, which is constituted by uh, kind of an advisory committee and then a governing body, more or less, um, meets on Fridays um, in September. So it's our hope to have adopted by, I think it's September 24th, if I remember correctly. Um, but as I said, that doesn't mean that your opportunity to participate in the long range plan ends on the 24th it continues past that process. We just need to have an adoption date um, for the plan. So given that context, um, let me do a couple of, I'll do a few of these highlights and Andrew will do some more um, for you. As, as I indicated at the beginning, safety is kind of, to me, it's kind of the goal, has a lot of implications uh, moving forward. So if you were to, uh, click on the safety component of the plan, you'll see some updated data um, and a couple of applications that one that we've already completed and another one that we're working on. Um, we're really trying to have basically, you know, virtually real time uh, access to crash data across the region and prioritize uh, off of that data. And then hopefully be able to address the funds to those kind of hotspots um, that we have. So what you, what you see on the screen right now is based off of uh, a tool that PennDOT has adopted. You see some of the places across our region where, where crashes are really kind of concentrated uh, above and beyond what you would normally expect for that type of road, that speed limit, that kind of a thing. So you can see some of the areas um, that we're focusing on, uh, Andrew can zoom in. That's one of the beauties of having an online plan is, you know, I know most people are really um, 
pretty much focused on their little part of the region. So this online mapping really gives you the opportunity to zoom in to, in essence, even your neighborhood um, to find out any of the data that's in the plan, how it's reflected in your corner of the world. So this is some regional mapping from a safety perspective. Want to scroll down here a little bit to the, yeah. there you go. Here's one of the tools that we've developed um, since the last plan. Um, and what this is, and, and you can access this through the Tri-County website, again, if you want to focus in, or you can get there through the uh, RTP. Um, it really shows you. So what you're looking at there with the green dots across the region are five years worth of crashes, um, reportable crashes in there. And you'll see this tool shows you a lot of different things. It gives you the number of fatalities in a particular area, serious injuries, total crashes, when they occurred in terms of day of the week or which year um, they may have occurred on. And then you can see across the bottom, um, the types of crashes. And then if you're interested in kind of specific types of crashes, maybe I'm looking down here and I see bike pet um, related, you can toggle on there and it'll even show you in that vicinity how many of the crashes in that area. And this data, as you might have noticed, um, when we were, when Andrew was zooming in, all the data changes with the extent of the map that you're looking at. So the closer you um, zoom in to your particular area, the more detailed uh, the data really is. So it's a tool that we're using to work with municipalities um, and others to understand what the real crash conditions are. And we are also working on kind of a regional uh, safety planning priority tool uh, that we expect to soon have available that'll really help us uh, and to zero in on segments that are particularly, I'll say problematic from a safety perspective. So we're really doing a lot of work um, on the safety front. So maybe move along. You know, a, a big part of any transportation plan is, is re relates to maintaining the assets that we have. Um, I, I did a, a statistic not too long ago. I found out if we looked at the what we call the federal aid roads or the roads in our region that um, are eligible to receive federal funds. If, if you ran them end to end, you could get from here to Salt Lake City. Um, so it's not a small system uh, that we're in charge of, of maintaining. There's a lot of needs. As you can see, there's a lot of bridges, that kind of thing. The one recent shift uh, in asset management planning is it used to be that these assets were addressed on a worst first nature. So the worst condition bridge, the worst condition road, um, you know, tended to attract the first dollars. Now um, you'll see on the screen, the approach is what they call lowest life cycle cost, which is in essence, how do you most effectively spend your money to extend the life uh, of resources across your region? So the plan, um, reflects this kind of adjustment in approach. And that's what we're using uh, to help assess priorities in terms of maintaining the current assets. Oh, and the other thing I, I, wanna, I wanna say here is you'll, you'll probably notice um, when you look at the road system on here, which is what I call the federal aid um, system, much of it you probably recognize as state-owned roads. Um, Although there's a significant number, there are hundreds of miles of uh, roads in our region that are locally owned, but federal aid eligible. And, and one of the priorities that we're, we're putting into the planning process moving forward is to make sure that those facilities, um, not being state roads, are getting a, a fair shake in terms of the prioritization process. So we're trying to apply the same analysis techniques that the department is using for their roads for those locally owned but federal aid eligible facilities. So that's something that you can identify. If you're not even sure in your municipality what those may be, you can get there by clicking on the plan and, uh, and finding that out. So just a highlight of asset management. And then I think the last 
topic I'm going to cover for you uh, today is uh, is congestion. And historically, um, Hats and, and Tri-County have done what they call a congestion management plan in kind of a static format, roughly speaking, every five years, something like that, which, which just means that we took a snapshot of delay or congestion data, use that to prioritize corridors, and then tried to make sense out of that in terms of programming. But again, it was the, the problem with that approach was that it was just a snapshot in time. Um, Kyle and I particularly have been working more recently and here in the upcoming year, we're gonna really take that approach and kind of turn it on its ear in that we're gonna base our congestion analysis, much like the safety data, on basically real-time information. The amount of information that's out there today in terms of congestion or delay is, is almost mind-boggling. Um, you can pick an, an hour in a day, any day of the year, and any, any, almost any road segment and determine what the delay condition was. So we're trying to take advantage of that data, um, not only to uh, assess priorities and, uh, and apply improvement dollars, but then to assess that we have used those dollars in an effective way. So after that change is made, did we make the desired improvement in congestion? So again, it's an ongoing process. So this congestion planning, although we adopt it as part of the, of the long range plan, it's a continual effort. So just another idea of how this process never really stops. So with that, I think, I'm gonna turn you over to Andrew. He had a couple more topics he wants to cover and then uh, we'll see what questions and comments sure. you might have. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so I'm gonna discuss uh, non-motorized transportation. Um, it, it, it's often overlooked or at least it doesn't get the same kind of level of analysis as much as, as, our, as our kind of motorized transportation network does. Uh, but it is still kind of, it, it is, is an absolute essential part of providing a comprehensive uh, transportation network, um, you know, providing safe and efficient and convenient connections for walking and biking and for quality of life, access to jobs, transit use, all these things that we, that, that kind of align with our goals that we're trying to promote as both HATS and Tri-County Regional Planning Commission. Uh, so that the, the 25 RTP non-motor chapter Builds on a lot of what we did for the previous RTP, but um, as a, it kind of takes it to the next step. So what we did a head demand heat map. That's actually the colors you see on essentially based on um, land uses. The darker the color. The, the more demand uh, this analysis is kind of showing us for walking and biking. Um, an, another uh, analysis we performed was, and that's what is sh the, the lines then are showing, is a bicycle level of stress. That's a, it, it's an analysis that, that uses, uh, it uses speed limit, lane count, and shoulder width. And, it's a general level of comfort um, that people would that, that a kind of a quote unquote normal cyclist uh, would experience while using the road. Um, I, I want to jump to you know, computers. You down, uh, you can do that top, the whole bar if you go like where it, yeah, right where you had the crosshairs. Scroll right there. Right there. You can drag that. Okay, there we go. So, and I don't know how well we uh, communicated this, you know, looking at the, uh, looking at the plant pages itself, th this is what they look like. You'll see these kind of links, these images within the plans. If you click on them, that'll take you to our interactive mapping application. So the other, the two things, that the, the demand, and the bicycle level of stress that I just discussed are shown on this map. Uh, the, the regional backbone 
which is kind of the, I wouldn't say the end result, but it, it's kind of our, our product of this sector. Uh, it, it combines existing facilities, routes and facilities and other things identified in other local uh, and regional planning studies, and then some, some bicycle and pedestrian, pedestrian advocate outreach um, that kind of creates a, it, well, a backbone um, to facilitate walking and biking across, across the region. It, it, is anybody else having, um, Cindy Foster's indicating she's having some audio issues. Is anybody else experiencing that? Yes. Yes, we are. Yes. Hmm. Yes. All right. Hold, hold on one second. We're going to try something to see if it gets better. All right, let me let me ask if you guys can hear us if you're still having that audio problem. I can hear you presently. I can all hear right. you all. All right, you we're, we're, we're gonna keep going then sure. and hopefully that to help fix yeah. the problem. Um, okay, so so the the what you're seeing on the screen right now is the regional and bicycle pedestrian backbone. Like I, I, I don't know how much uh, you guys heard, uh, it, it basically combines existing facilities, uh, what we've identified in, in our planning efforts, uh, what other kind of local planning uh, documents and studies and efforts have identified as their important routes. Um, combined it to, to create what, you know, what we call a backbone to, to kind of facilitate um, major, bike ped travel across the region and, and connect the major uh, the major destinations. This, this doesn't kind of prescribe any specific solutions. It just kind of highlights the general routes. Um, and, and the idea is that then some of these more local projects um, and local studies that a lot of you guys at the municipal level perform can then connect to these backbone segments that that kind of start to create that network of bike ped movement that that is really key to 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 a, a comprehensive system so um so next i want to talk a little bit about environmental justice uh so in transportation planning, when we talk about environmental justice, that essentially comes from an executive order that came out during the Clinton administration uh, that kind of required federal programs to uh, examine and prevent adverse and disproportionate impacts to low income populations and minority populations. So, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in recent years, had staff along with um, with the staffs of, of the other uh, MPOs in, in PennDOT District 8, have been taking a, a pretty comprehensive and critical look at our own environmental justice kind of processes, what you know, what we do and how effective they are. Uh, and, and we all participated in, in what was called the, the, the Unified Methodology Study, which we did in cooperation with Rutgers University. Um, and from that, you know, we got a, a, a really great and comprehensive and, and, and very full document of, of lots of things and ways to improve. Um, we, we took that document and developed kind of a, a set of what, what are called the core elements, things that kind of everybody should do as part of their environmental justice evaluations. So um, the 2045 plan, I would say has the the is kind of our first our first effort at doing it the, the full 
evaluation that was identified in those core elements. The last plan incorporated some elements, but, but not all. Um, so in particular, we did, there's, a, there's, there's analysis that looks at asset condition, both road and bridge, uh, safety, both, both uh, vehicular and bike bed, and transit access, and kind of how those, how those things relate and how our system performs in areas of, of high, medium, and low concentrations of low income and, and minority populations. Um, so then, uh, so we're, we kind of look at it from an existing condition aspect. And then we also look at it from a uh, from the, the program projects and identified needs. So kind of what's the existing condition and then how well are we, is, is what we're proposing going to start to address that. Um, so it's important to note though, that this, this analysis is only kind of a, it, it's a snapshot captured at this point in time. This is the thing that we're gonna keep, keep refining, um, keep developing. Um, we have a working group with, with other uh, planning partners in, in the entire state actually that we're, this is kind of a major effort that, that we're kind of collectively undertaking. Um, but I wanted to highlight it and, and make sure, you know, everyone here is aware and, and has an opportunity to, to look at, at that. So I think that gets us to, so that, that gets us to kind of the, the meat of, of kind of at least the implementation part of the plan. Um, and especially for you uh, municipal folks, kind of your most critical involvement in the plan is our is our project pipeline and our transportation needs. So hopefully, the, you guys are all pretty familiar with with this form you're seeing on screen. It's our transportation needs form. Uh, it, it's basically the beginning of our process. Um, anybody in the well, anybody can submit a, a transportation need to us. Um, they just need to fill out this form. It asks, asks some basic information on who, who's submitting the need, what the need is, you know, what, what issues, sec primary, secondary. Just trying to collect uh, as much information about the problem um, as possible. And then at the bottom, it actually asks you to go in and draw or at least gives you the opportunity to draw a, uh, make sure we know what exactly which intersection, exactly what corridor. So, you know, um, so again, just trying to collect as much information as possible. Uh, then our next step as a, as a staff is to go to the municipality to discuss kind of level of support for this project particularly submitted by somebody who's not a representative of the municipality. So sometimes we'll get you know, we'll needs submitted that are, let's say outside the scope of our, of our capabilities. Those would not be advanced as, as transportation needs. But if a municipality comes to us, fills this out and, uh, and supports the need uh, that, that's being identified, the next step on that is, is the evaluation of that need and um, in addition to what we call our project pipeline. So um, kind of at the beginning of our, of our project pipeline process for this plan, we actually spend months uh, performing outreach with municipalities. I, Looking at the attendance list here, I think we had a few meetings with with some of you guys that are that are on this call. Um, in an effort to kind of create and identify the most comprehensive list possible for transportation needs in the region for us to then evaluate. Um, so that evaluation, the first step was uh, as we, we have a work group here at at, at HATS. Um, that, that looked at the, the point structure for how these needs are evaluated 
we identified these 10 categories that you see here. Um, of That's kind of how, how we were evaluating them. And then we basically took 100 points and collectively as a work group and as, a, as an MPO, distributed the 100 points throughout these 10 categories um, kind of in a way that best aligned with our with our goals that we looked at above. Um, so I can tell you safety, congestion, and asset management were the highest, were, were kind of the, identified as the most important and as such, they have the most points. I think of safety, I believe has, you know, 20 out of a hundred points. So, um, you know, that 20% of the total points possible there. So essentially we, we, we map a handful of data sources. These are actually our data sources and this, uh, this PDF is available on, on the project pipeline um, chapter of, of, the, of the draft plan, actually right here. That'll take you to this. This shows you, um, this shows you the, the point structure and how things basically, how those needs earn points in the evaluation. So if you're on a high priority corridor or, lo or location for safety, you get 15 points. And again, we're trying to take all of the things we do in, throughout the plan and apply them then to this evaluation. So you can kind of go through each category. Again, there's 10 categories for 100 points. The end result then is a list of, of, uh, of kind of evaluated needs that each of these needs gets a point total. And then those point totals are examined and we kind of set thresholds for what constitutes a high, medium, and low priority uh, priority need. Um, those priorities then are used as, you know, Steve mentioned earlier, the, the, the transportation improvement program, those prior, those high priority projects are what we focus on uh, as, as we look to add projects and select projects for the day. So using the interactive mapping application here, you can click on any of these needs and get a, a good summary of you know, the, the, the identified need, what its priority level was, what its stated primary need is, and then how it scored across all of the, all of the categories. And you can go through any of these, you know, any of these identified needs um, and kind of get as much information as, as you want out of there. And again, all of these points link back to the, the kind of relevant uh, chapter in the RTP. So so I think that kind of wraps up um, wraps up most of our, our planned information and what we wanted to really get across um in this information session regarding the rtp as part of this public uh comment period we also have a public participation plan update um there there weren't i, I wouldn't say there's extensive updates to the public participation plan uh, as you can see here we added some information you know we when we did this plan a few years ago virtual meetings were certainly not as popular as they are now so we added some information and kind of and, and policies regarding how those are conducted and some other information on, on kind of the updated regional growth management plan and PennDOT Connect, some other things that have, have come since the last uh, public participation plan update. Uh, there's also the air quality conformity analysis report. Um, we have to, all, all of our programs have to fit within air quality conformity. This is essentially a docu a, a very technical document that goes through um, all of the relevant uh, pollutants and emissions and basically analyzes whether or not we are 
consistent with uh, federal standards. So that, that report is available through this uh, story map. It's also available up here at, at the bottom. So I think with that, we're kind of ready to entertain any questions, any comments, um, clarification on anything that you're that you're at that you're you know you're unclear on. Um, you know, I guess this is the public comment portion of the of, of the proceedings here. So whether you're comfortable with unmuting and then the asking question or offering comment, or if you prefer to use the chat box, either either way, um, we're open to whatever questions or questions you might have at this point. Looks like we have one from Gail, so I'm gonna up. Oh, Gail, go ahead. Good afternoon. Thanks for this update. First of all, really appreciate it. Um, and my question is probably going to be an obvious one to most anyone who knows me. Where are we at with the Lemoyne bottleneck project? Well, Gail, uh, I'm, I'm shocked that that's your question. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I think the Lemoyne bottleneck uh, project is a great example of success of the planning process because it was identified as a need during the previous plan. It, it ranked right at the top of the, of the priority listings and it made it onto the tip. Um, the other thing that I can offer, it's, it's my understanding that, and don't, don't quote me on this please, but it's my understanding that today is the day when the department was going to identify the consultant selected uh, to lead the design phase. So I'm waiting to hear the details on that, but that project may already be started uh, in essence, but as I said, it was a great uh, example of being identified during the planning process, funded, and now the design phase is underway. Are you sure I can't quote you on that, Steve? Uh, you can if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to hear that, good news. Is there anybody else with any comments, questions? Hi, this is Dana Cotton. Um, I had a question regarding the uh, the bicycle stress map um, that you had showed. Uh, you had said that that data was um, uh, you you used the quote typical cyclist to determine that data and what the stress would be. Um, what do you consider a typical cyclist? Because I noticed some of those roads, you know, I, I personally wouldn't bike down them. Um, you know, is there any thought to maybe doing like an eight to 80, uh, a, a usability for those, those routes to be considered? Sure. Um, and I can say, so the, I, I'd have to pull up the specific methodology, but there's typically when we look at kind of cyclist comfort, they typically put them into four broad categories. And I, I believe that's what the, the uh, bicycle level of stress analysis kind of tries to fit the roads in, fit each road into. If we go back to that level of stress analysis. Uh, yeah. You know, everything, Everything a three or a four is is kind of a quote unquote uncomfortable road. I, I think most of the, the the impression certainly that this uh, analysis is giving is that the majority of our region is a relatively uncomfortable road for most cyclists. So I, I certainly uh, you know, I, I, I understand your, your concern. I, I think the, I, I forget the four, the four categories, but, but the generally the, the ones and twos that you see here is what I would say the kind of non serious you know, the recreational and, and kind of willing, but, but skeptical of, of on-road cycling. Uh, that that's where where it would fall. Okay, 
but I can I can certainly follow up with with more information if if you want some kind of additional detail. Okay, thank you. We have a, we have a question in the chat box. Um, you may see, but it basically it says the transportation sector is responsible for roughly a third of the greenhouse gas emissions in Carlisle and. A, I would broaden that to regionally uh, or nationally, if, if not internationally. Um, to what degree is climate action prioritized in the decision-making process and what specific steps have been taken to, to curb greenhouse gas emissions? Um, first thing I'm gonna do in, re in response to that question is point you towards that air quality uh, conformity report um, and the analysis done there. You know, Not only can we not identify um, projects that we can't reasonably expect to fund, but we can't identify and, and fund projects that contribute significantly to the worsening of air quality. And that's what that, that air quality conformity report, as Andrew indicated, is a pretty highly technical document, which looks at the combined projects or the overall program and it helps us ensure that that does not have a detrimental effect and to the extent possible has a positive effect uh, on air quality throughout the region. So I, I'm gonna point you towards that particular document uh, to look at and, and possibly provide comments uh, on moving forward. And uh, in addition to that, one thing I'd like to offer is not only do we do the air quality conformity analysis, we also participate in an air quality uh, work group, which is representatives from the other metropolitan planning organizations across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, as well as um, PennDOT, DEP, and EPA. So we all are working together in unison to um, ensure that you know air quality conformity is maintained, and uh, we also work on other initiatives uh, to kind of enhance air quality throughout the Commonwealth. And I'll just also add. <laughs> As the bike ped coordinator here, I, I you know, if you look at both our goals and objectives and then how we evaluate those project pipeline uh, needs, you'll see um, mobility and accessibility uh, kind of explicit um, bike ped uh, need, as well as transit access are, are, are three, you know, they're not the highest priority, but if you actually look, if you begin to add up the points, the, those rise essentially, you know, those are kind of how we, we enable non-motorized transportation it, it kind of across the board. And, and I think how we really start to tackle um, and reduce carbon emissions. And, and just because I can, I'll, I'll add, uh one more point to this, something that we don't, and we've been kind of focusing on specific projects uh, that we have as part of the long range plan. Another thing that HATS does is we're one of the major uh, funding bodies for a regional, the regional effort. Um, it's typically known as commuter services, um, where we there's a, a whole staff that um, seeks to get people out of single occupancy cars to do carpooling, ride sharing, uh, take transit, uh, do non-motorized transportation. So we, on an ongoing basis, are, are a big part of making that effort uh, possible um, across the region. So thanks for the question. Any other comments or questions? Boris. Hi, this is Dana again. I'm sorry. I just had one more uh, comment question to add. Um, I know that you said that this is a living document um, and it seems to be designed within the constraints of current funding. Um, you know, is there any reason why we couldn't include some like maybe bigger ideas on there such as you know, light rail or trolley cars in the smaller towns um, as a way to move people efficiently 
Um, obviously, you know, with current funding, that's not really feasible, but kind of to say, hey, if we had, you know, more funding, we'd be able to do this, reduce the amount of people in cars, uh, right. build up denser downtowns, et cetera. Yeah, Dana, this is Steve. The, the, I'll, I'll call it a limitation uh, that we have on that, but it's, it's what in the federal planning regs is known as fiscal constraint. So you're, you are not allowed in a long range plan to identify projects uh, to move forward if you don't have the finances or you don't expect to have the finances to pay for them. Um, we, we do have a somewhat of an opportunity in that we can identify some things as what they call illustrative, uh, which, are, which are kind of along the lines of what you're talking about, things that we would hope to do should the money become available. Um, so we would certainly welcome any comments on, on ideas like that, that you would like to see identified as possibly illustrative uh, projects moving forward, but they, they truly have to be kind of handled off to the side of the pipeline and, and the, the tip itself, simply because, as you indicated, the funding's not there yet. Okay, thank you. All right, we have another um, question here in the chat box. It says, how does the balance get created between increasing mass transit use at the same, there is a push to increase the number of lanes across the river from, from six to 10? Uh, I, Joe, I think the, um, the uh, I don't know, I'll say the, the reality there is that there is a priority for both of those things. Um, and one of the things we didn't really mention yet that we do is we do try to co cooperate regularly with CAT. In fact, they just finished pulling together what they call the transit development plan, which is when they look at the mass transit system, how can they optimize and improve upon those uh, facilities and offerings available through CAT uh, to provide service to the region. So that, that happens virtually at the same time as this transportation uh, planning that we're talking about doing. So it's, it's really our goal to accommodate both um, local transit needs and, you know, in the terms of 83 that you're mentioning there, kind of regional or pass-through needs uh, to the large part that happens. So it, it is a balancing act to try to accommodate both. Any other, oh, hope Joe, that helped uh, answer your questions. Anybody else have uh, questions or comments to, to offer at this point? And who, who have, we have a person that, that's not identified only by their phone number ending in one, two, eight for our, for the sake of our kind of documentation requirements. Can you, can you identify yourself? Maybe someone's audio connection um, that's otherwise on the call. 717 area code and the last three digits are 128. Maybe they stepped away or something. All right. Well, I guess if you know we're not we're not seeing any additional um, questions pop up, but as we indicated, this formal public comment period runs through the end of August, so you have ample opportunity to get in touch with us um, before we adopt the plan. And as I said at the beginning, um, we certainly hope uh, to work with everyone here as well as others. Uh, you know, over the long term to continually enhance um, this plan, build upon our listing of needs and get projects funded like we just indicated here a minute ago with the uh, Lemoyne bottleneck as an example. 
of something that went through this process and and is being put into reality. So with that, um, you know, as indicated here at the bottom of the screen, you can offer comment uh, directly to Lauren Weaver in our office, or if you're more familiar with Andrew or myself, whoever you're comfortable with communicating here at Tri-County, we'll, we'll certainly take that comment or answer any questions um, that we can um, moving forward. But we, we thank you for being part of today's uh, presentation. Feel free to reach out and offer any comments you would like, and we will address them in this plan, um, hopefully before the September adoption. Um, but again, work with you long term uh, to try to get the transportation improvements uh, that we all want put into place. So with that, I, I thank you. And I think we'll stop today's session and the recording will be available. We will post that on the website along with the materials. Um, Andrew already indicated if you got the email, you got a link to the plan itself, that kind of thing. But again, if that's something um, that you'd like to make sure you have your hands on uh, after the fact, feel free to reach out to us and we'll make any of these materials available to you. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Stop the share then.